Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if you're enjoying this podcast, I need you to do me a favor. Take a minute and leave us a rating and review, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, we got a very special guest today. It's taking me a little bit of time to track this guy down, but today we've got Evan Holiday coming on the podcast. So let me tell you just a little bit more about Evan Holiday. All right. Evan is a real estate developer and investor with over $225 million and 1,300 units of multifamily real estate developed and invested. Evan is the founder and CEO at Holiday Ventures, where their team specializes in creating and investing in workforce, affordable, and mixed income communities. Now, Evan is also the host of the top 200 business and real estate podcast called Monumental. Now, there he sits down with top leaders and entrepreneurs making massive change in the world. Let's welcome to the show, Evan Holiday. Yes. Thank you for having me, John. Great to be here. Absolutely, Evan. It's great to have you on the show. I know we've known each other for a little bit and uh, had a chance to connect last year, a little bit around this time at the Best Ever Conference. And, uh, you know, schedules didn't really line up right away, but uh, you've been growing and doing big things, had a great 2019. I know your 2020 is off to a phenomenal start. Why don't you take a minute and fill in a little bit of the gaps as far as your background uh, in real estate development? Yes. So I like to say it all started for me really in college. I was going down the pre-med route and realized very quickly that uh, medicine and and science and chemistry just were not my thing. Uh, And I realized I was like, well, I like helping people. I like making a difference and I want to have a big impact. You know, how can I best make that happen? And it just literally kind of stumbled into my lap as far as real estate, I was, you know, talking to a, a mentor of mine and I was like, Hey, you know, that, that development looks really cool over there. Like that, that looks like something I w- want to be doing. This was at university of Louisville in Kentucky. And I saw this $55 million development. I was like, I want to be a part of that. And so my mentor was like, really? Like, I know the developer owner, I, I can introduce you. And one thing leads to another. And I get that introduction uh, you know, of course it doesn't immediately lead to a job, but he's like, Hey, you know, prove your worth, you know, what, you know, show me that, that I should bring you on. And so we brought basically, he's like, bring some people out to the groundbreaking and then we'll talk. And I ended up bringing like 200 people out to his groundbreaking. And after that, I was the first one he hired, uh, to basically see this thing through, lease it up. So I, I basically saw like, you know, literally foundation coming out of the ground, you know, framing coming out, like builders everywhere, um, signing retail tenants, signing residential um, leases, and basically leased this thing up in five months and learned so much from this deal. Um, And I also learned what not to do. Uh, But I learned so much from that. I was like, man, I'm hooked. Like I'm all in real estate, multifamily, like this is my jam. And I just got really excited about it. And so we, we actually took this in a class, an entrepreneurship class at the school. And they're like, you know, the part of the class is to start a company. I was like, well, I don't know what I want to do, but it's something in real estate. And so out of that class, myself and four other people, we started a modular development company where we actually had houseboats, the same layout as a houseboat, basically the same shape, the same building as a houseboat, uh, that rectangular shape. And we had uh, these factories in Southeast Kentucky that had laid off 1,100 skilled workers we're like, well, how can we put those same people back to work, use the same facilities that are now like sitting dormant, not nobody's using them and use the same layout as a houseboat. Just instead of putting it on water, we're putting it on land and putting it on top of a foundation. And so we took that idea and we built that out and we actually had um, architect students and professors at University of Kentucky. They did all of our plans for us. So we already had all these plans. We're like, well, let's, let's actually take this we had some single family units built and we're like, well, let's really scale this and really make an impact and, and go big. And so that's when we decided multifamily 
was where we were going to do with modular. And so we were, we were looking at how can we make this work in Louisville? And that's when, you know, pitching this idea, looking for partners with capital and experience, two things I did not have at that time. And so I found a group and ended up playing a round of golf with them. And somehow, some way, at the end of the golf round, they're like, hey, you know, how about you come work with us and we'll make this very similar thing happen where you're creating affordable housing, workforce housing, and really making a difference. And so I, I knew this was an opportunity it was, you know, too good to pass up where I can learn from a group of guys that have been doing this combined, you know, over a hundred years. And so I, I really just kind of went straight into the deep end there. And they, they were like, Hey, you know, it's up to you source deals, find deals and put together multifamily development deals. And, and keep in mind, like all I had done was like help put together like a single family modular deal up to that point uh, with a lot of like grant money. And so this was all very new to me. And I, and I, I really just, I loved every second of it and I soaked it up. And I loved also kind of what we were talking about earlier of like the, the impact that I could have with my work. Like we weren't just building luxury multifamily housing. We were actually building affordable workforce housing, you know, for families making 30 to 60,000 a year, families that need a quality place to go home, but can't necessarily afford a good place or can't afford a place in town. And so that really gave me a lot of motive um, to push harder and figure this whole thing out. Uh, and really, it took me about two years to get my first deal, uh, but it was a 192-unit deal mm. uh, in Baton Rouge and basically sourced all the equity, found the land. Um, it was at, at tax credits. So we used tax credits. I got the tax credits awarded and approved. Um, but it, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of brain damage, a lot of learning. Uh, but now, you know, Six, seven years later, we've done 1,300 units and uh, have learned a whole lot in the process and now have really scaled up that vision to say, okay, how can we take this nationwide, worldwide, and make a massive impact and make a, a, a good quality, you know, a, a good lifestyle for ourselves and our family? No, I love it. Holiday, I mean, listen, you have now launched Holiday Adventures, right? Where, yep. Which is where you're at today. Uh, I do want to just quickly recap a couple of things. So you, you were in college, you, I just love the, uh, some folks will call it luck. And I will say, listen, you have to ask the question. You never know who knows who or what opportunities are there, but you just ask your mentor or tell your mentor, this is what you want to do. And he tells you, I actually know the developer. Do you want to meet him? Yeah. You know, and from there that, that really sparks the journey. And I think part of that is, you know, for anyone who's a fan of the book, The Secret, you know, it talks about, you know, uh, really having a positive mindset and, and putting what you want into the out there into the universe. And I think that is a perfect example of that. They didn't just give you an opportunity and just say, okay, here, you're, you're the, the manager running this. But by just verbalizing this thing that you had an interest in doing, the opportunities kind of created themselves. I think the next time that really comes up in the story is when you went out on that golf course with those, those partners and you're learning from them and talking to them. I think each time you're taking initiative to put yourself in that position, even as a young person back then. And I think that is the one thing to take away for our listeners is, you know, you can have a phenomenal network, but if you are not taking action and being proactive and putting what you want out into the universe, it's going to be very difficult for other people to know how they can help you. And I think you did an excellent job of that. So you also talked to, Oh, go ahead. Evan. I was just wanted to add it. Like, I, I feel like relationships are also like in, in relationships with your mentors or, or even just your broader network is you kind of think about it like a, you know, a seed and a plant, like you're growing a relationship. You have to cultivate that relationship. You have to like constantly invest in it. You have to water your plants, you know? And so to bring up another point of that same mentor that introduced me to the developer when I was 19 years old in college. So I, I went back to his house, uh, you know, six months ago and I just wanted to thank him and spend some time with him and just truly appreciate him. And so when I told him this whole story of how like that introduction led me to where I am today, and he didn't really know that until now. Um, and so bringing that up to him, he was very grateful for me appreciating him. And then I told him really my next vision is to not only build affordable housing, but empower residents 
to make uh, their own massive difference and, and make their own monumental change in the world and empower them to live their best life uh, through education and financial literacy and different things like that, like actually taking it a step further and providing services for our residents. And he's like, really? He's like, that actually, I know a executive director of a nonprofit who she wants to take that same service that she already does and take it nationwide there could be some real synergies there. I was like, oh my gosh, like every time I just put out into the universe what I'm looking for, this, you know, mentor of mine delivers. It's, it's amazing. So I, I say that to like cultivate those relationships, like keep in touch. Absolutely. Especially those power connectors. I mean, those people who have great networks and are all about seeing that change. I mean, that's phenomenal to, to hear. So you started talking a little bit about affordable housing and impacting communities. I want to focus more of our conversation around that. So right now you have Holiday Ventures. I know you're working on a couple of different projects and what you've been working on over those 1,300 units that we've talked about before we're really in these affordable, um, affordable income communities. Talk to me a little bit more about why that's important and what are some of the differences that you see when you focus on kind of affordable communities versus maybe market rate or, or some of the other communities that people invest in? Yes. Yeah, so it really happened. I mean, it, it really happened all the way back in college. We kind of looked at, we're like, we're like, how can we actually build something that, we know is is going to make a difference is going to help people a lot more than just building luxury housing or student housing where these people could afford to live anywhere you know it's not like we're providing anything different um and that's that's what really hit us we're like we should be doing something that's truly mixed income that's helping people um that might not be able to afford a brand new place to call home would never be able to afford at their current income levels and so we're figuring out, you know, through creative financing, through getting involved with the community, um, through getting, you know, political support, uh, city leadership, finding cities that actually support this and see demand and need and saying, hey, how can we actually like build long term uh, affordable options? And what we also like to call attainable housing options, because it, it's really like affordable can have this negative connotation in a lot of people's minds and really what we're, we're just trying to build something that is attainable for people and not, not spending their entire paycheck on rent, not spending 70% of everything that they make in a month on, on rent. They should really be spending like 30%. And so that, that's what really struck us. We're like, you know what? There's a lot of people out there that need this and it's only going to continue to grow. I, and we couldn't even, you know, 10 years ago, we couldn't foresee what the demand is now. It's crazy because you know, it's, it's just a supply and demand question of like, they're just not building enough housing and especially not enough affordable housing. So now all of your, your middle income or your workforce families are being priced out or being pushed out to suburbs or being pushed into lower quality living. And it's really becoming an academic epidemic where every city's like, Hey, we, we have a problem. Like I've had cities literally reach out to me and say, Hey, Evan, like, We've seen you've had some success over here in this other city. Can you please come to our city and make affordable housing work somehow? Because we can't figure it out. And cities are literally begging for this now. And, and it's crazy that it's come to that. Um, but it, it also provides a lot of opportunity for us to like actually make a difference. Yeah. And Evan, I mean, your point is spot on, right? I mean, this is an, a really big issue. Um, you know, I spent the last, a lot of time in Chicago the last eight years and the way people are looking at attacking this issue, it runs a gamut, right? They're all over the board. Everything from, well, we need rent control, right? That's one thing that some folks are proposing is rent control. I am pretty firm that I do not believe rent control is the appropriate answer because I think that it doesn't incentivize right. landlords and owners to keep properties uh, upkept to, you know, be good property owners, which is the thing we want to make sure is that it works for everybody involved. Um, so when we talk about affordable or attainable housing, I think most people can nod their head and say, yes, housing should be affordable. The challenge is how do you get there? Because, you know, as a as an investor myself, on a lot of deals, when you think about new development, if you're pr strictly talking about private capital, it's really difficult to make the numbers work on an yeah. affordable housing type of deal. I know that you are looking at a couple of different ways. And if cities are calling you to say, hey, you've had success here, how do you have success in our city? Or can you come to our city and help us? 
how are you able to drive some success developing affordable housing? Yeah, I, I would say the overarching, um, the overarching way to look at this and the way to find um, you know, a path to creating a more affordable housing is really behind cities, uh, local governments, counties, uh, and political leaders to actually stand up and say, hey, we stand for this. We believe in this. We are going to finance this. We're going to help put our money where our mouth is, and we're going to support development of affordable housing. Um, that's been the biggest thing I've seen. If, if a city says, hey, we'll do whatever it takes to make this happen, it makes our lives like a hundred times easier to get this done because you have that support. When we're going into cities and, you know, the, the council member for that district or the mayor's office is kind of being standoffish or won't support us, then that makes our jobs a hundred times harder. It's already hard enough to figure this out uh, with all the different hoops you have to jump through for tax credits and financing purposes. But really, like, if you, if you have the back of your local leaders, if they have your back, then this can go so much more quickly. And really, it comes down to, like, figuring out ways that, you know, local governments can put up grants or tax abatements. Uh, what we talked about of, like, if they can say, hey, we'll defer your taxes for 10 to 20 years, whatever that number is, that makes it so we can borrow a bigger loan, um, which which in turn helps us finance these rents that we can keep at a, at a manageable level for our families um, that are living in our communities. And that's really what helps make it happen. So it's it's a combination of a federal tax credit program that's each state decides who gets the credits um, and then combining that federal program with the local grants or tax abatements. That's really what makes it happen. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, you have to go through entitlements, you have to go through rezonings. So that's, again, where the politics come into play. You have to have strong community leaders, strong, um, you know, civic leaders that are going to say, hey, I recognize this is a problem. You know, they're they're educated on it. They understand that affordable housing is like the backbone of your community. And that's that's kind of what got me into it. I was like, hey, like if we don't provide affordable housing, then our cities are just going to like crumble from the inside out. And you're seeing that in some cities like Seattle, uh, San Francisco, like people are moving out because they're like, this is just unaffordable. Even for your middle income family, they're like, hey, I can't even live here. Like what, why would I want to, you know, live in this little shoebox apartment? And so you're seeing that like people are moving out of expensive places because cities didn't do a good job up front of investing in affordable housing. Yeah, I think I saw somewhere that like, I don't know if it's San Francisco or Seattle, it's one of them, but uh, the the threshold for it to, for it to be affordable is like a hundred thousand uh, dollars income or something like that, which is crazy yeah. to make six yeah. figures and still basically not be able to, to afford to live in a place is absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, you've given a lot of uh, great information thus far um, for our folks who are not into development or maybe not so familiar with affordable housing. I want to just do something a little different. You know, I want to throw out some of the terms that you've been saying, and maybe you can give us a very brief definition just to make sure everyone's following along in the conversation. Okay. So we've said the word affordable housing a few different times. What exactly constitutes affordable? Is there a certain like metric or threshold, but maybe you can just define what affordable housing actually is. Right. So affordable housing, the way HUD defines it, uh, the way the, the United States government defines it is basically for any family making up to 60 percent of the area median income. So like in Nashville, where I live, uh, the area median income for a family making 60 percent of the average, that's basically anywhere from 30 to I think it's 65,000, depending on your family size, depending on how many you know children you have. Um, it's basically that is the range that we service is 30 to 65,000. Now, if we have other grants or other programs, we can go up to 80%. Um, and so then in that case, we're going up to 75,000. Um, so it's, it's really is like, if you think about it, it's working class families, families that are making decent money, um, but don't have any, very many options. Like we, we looked up the, in, in Nashville, like the, um, the, the nurses, entry-level nurses, entry-level firefighters, entry-level policemen, entry-level administrative um, people in within metro government all make around $45,000 a year. 
And so you're looking at it, you're like, hey, th- these are people, Metro employees that could live in our apartments. Um, so to answer your question, it's really for those, the middle income range of families. I think the important takeaway is people hear affordable and I think they immediately go to government subsidized section eight, some sort of housing authority, you know, very yep. low income uh, communities. And there's nothing wrong with that either. But I just wanted to clarify because it's actually more that blue collar, middle class, working class families. And it's much bigger than just kind of the lower income uh, classes. So thank you for clarifying that. All right. The other thing you mentioned a couple of times was tax credits. Explain exactly tax credits. I know you started talking about federal to, to state, but maybe you can give a little bit more context to tax credits and then how a developer, how a real estate investor can tap into those tax credits for investing purposes. Yes. Yeah, so, so tax credits are basically an incentive program by the federal government to help encourage it. It's like this great pr- public private partnership um, where you're having private developers for profit and nonprofit being able to take a government incentive program in the form of a tax credit. And that tax credit roughly on average for the ones we use covers about 40% of our costs of construction. And so we, the credits come from the federal government. They go to state housing agencies. The states decide how to allocate those credits, where to allocate, what types of projects. And so we have to apply for those credits, get awarded those credits. And then we in turn as developers We, you know, you have to put together a good project in the first place to get awarded. But once you have those credits, then you actually go to third party investors and you sell those credits for cash equity into your development. So that covers roughly 40% of the cost of our construction. We get a loan for about 50%. And then we have other grants or, or other funding that covers that last 10%. And when you say sell that credit, maybe you can explain a little bit more there. So you, you have the credit. Give me more context when you say sell that credit to an investor. Yeah, so the the tax credits are dollar for dollar write off on your tax liability. So we're typically working with you know um, Key Bank, uh, Chase Bank, uh, U.S. Bank, um, Bank of America. You know these big um, national banks that that basically are one. They're required to be investing in tax credits. They're required to be uh, investing in lower income neighborhoods as part of the um, Community Reinvestment Act of 1986, basically saying banks cannot redline. And so we have these banks that are in, you know, in a way required to get our tax credits, buy our tax credits. And so they're basically looking at this investment. It's almost like you take your, your, your standard um, market style invest multifamily investment and you flip it upside down. We're basically saying like they want the tax uh, write-offs they want the tax credits, they want the depreciation, and they want the losses. They do not want any of the actual cash flow. They do not want any of the appreciation. They want to look at this as a way to offset their current tax liability. Um, so it's a very unique investing opportunity, and we're typically dealing with banks or institutions that have you know, 10 to $15 million worth of tax write-offs. That's typically how many tax credits Uh, we sell for each project. No, it's amazing. And I think there's obviously a lot of great opportunities there to partner with those banks to do these kind of deals. What kind of requirements do they expect of a developer? Would they work with a first time developer? Do they, uh, what what kind of requirements are they typically looking for? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. And, And really the, the premises, and I've had conversations with them about this of like, you know, what, what do they look for? Uh, and somebody that's getting started or somebody that's doing their first deal, what does that look like to them? And they said, really, it comes down to, you know, the, it really, number one, it comes down to the project. It comes down to whether or not it's a good project, well-funded. Obviously, the first project you're going to be doing, especially if it's first in, in tax credit or affordable, it needs to be well-sourced. It needs to be, you know, have significant cushion for them to be comfortable with it. Uh, But then also it comes down to you and your track record. If you haven't done affordable before, then ideally you partner with somebody that has on that first deal, Um, somebody that can show you the ropes. Because honestly, there there are so many different hoops and uh, rules and random like acronyms that you need to know uh, as an affordable developer. 
um, that, you know, I'm still learning every day new, new parts of the program. Um, but I think getting started, it takes just that partnership with somebody else that's already done it and making sure you put together, you know, a, a pretty dang good deal, just like you would an acquisition, you know, with a, a, a syndication deal, you want to make sure your first deal's close to a home run. Um, so that you can build that track record and continue doing deals and not just have it be a, a one-time thing. All right. The next one is TIF. Explain what a TIF <laughs> is. Yes. TIF is tax increment financing. Uh, and that is basically, it's saying that instead of you paying taxes, so whatever your tax liability would be once the development is completed, um, you're saying that the government agrees to the local government that collects real estate taxes is basically agreeing to say, we will not collect the real estate taxes, but instead of taxes, you will pay um, basically debt service on a new loan called a TIF loan. And instead of taxes, that, that same annual payment that you would pay for taxes, you'll just pay for the loan. So it just allows you to borrow additional capital up front. And then at some agreed upon point, that TIF loan wears off, you paid off the TIF loan, and then you start reverting back to real estate taxes. Um, so it's a way for governments to incentivize new development um, that is usually has some sort of community good or like economic good for the city. And so they're willing to forego taxes on the front end in order to realize the new development and then also taxes on the back end. All right, last one for this little mini segment we broke out of nowhere, <laughs> tax abatement. Yes, so very similar to TIF. It's just a different way of structuring it. Uh, it's basically saying that <clears throat> instead, of, instead of actually like having that amount be collected and like, just like your real estate taxes, they're just saying like, hey, you don't have to pay us real estate taxes for X amount of years, or you pay a certain percentage, like maybe we've had projects where we pay 10% of what we would normally pay for taxes or 20%. And so they still collect that certain amount, but then you are not, you are not held liable to pay the rest of that until that agreement um, comes out or, or finishes. And so that again, allows you to just borrow more debt um, so that you can help finance the deal on the front end. All right. So listen, a lot of great information there. I think for many of our listeners, they may be saying, dude, I'm just trying to find a decent contractor. Now you're telling me <laughs> I've got to, I got to go and figure out how to work with the city officials and everything else to do a deal. So obviously there's, there's more complexity if you're going to go the affordable housing route, especially when it comes to new development, we haven't even gotten into zoning and planning and all those things. So a lot of moving pieces there. Right. Clearly, you know your stuff and know how to get the projects moving along. If uh, if you have specific development questions, especially when it comes to affordable housing, I do implore you to reach out to Evan and he can certainly give you more information on that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit more about working with government, right? So you talked about public-private partnerships. And I think that's a critical aspect of not just new developments, but also really, you know, any kind of commercial development uh, and commercial um, redevelopment, you know, for those folks who are syndicating, looking to go in and, and renovate properties, revitalize community, having a relationship with the community is really key. As we were just talking about tax abatements, you know, um, one, one thing that I don't think enough people do is just understand what are the current policies for tax abatements? You know, we have a, a smaller project, the 28 unit here in a, a smaller city in the Cincinnati area. And I went into the office and I'm talking to them and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm putting a lot of money into these projects. You know, like, could you guys maybe give me some sort of tax abatements on the, uh, on the, on the, on the taxes there? And they were like, well, no, but if you were building condos or if you're going to convert them from apartments to condos, we would. I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going to do that. But good to know for future reference, right? So uh, when you talk about not just tax abatements, but really trying to forge that partnership between public and private, how do you go about that? And at what stage in the project do you reach out to say, hey, look, let's go sit down. Let's have a conversation. Let's understand what they're looking for and how we can create a win-win situation. Yeah, honestly, that's that's a great point. A great takeaway is that, you know, there, there typically is a lot that a city wants to do to, to change the face of the city, 
to, um, you know, redevelop the city to, um, you know, basically make the, the city a better place to live. Um, and, and so they are typically, sometimes they have their own goals, they have their own motives, they have their own, like, you know, things that they're trying to push. Maybe, um, there's a certain part of town that they're trying to get redeveloped a certain corridor, um, you know, in some parts of town and especially in the more urban parts, they look at ways to basically say, Hey, you know, even if you're just, if you're building anything or you're redeveloping anything or you're fixing something up, like if you do that, we will, if you're in this zone, we'll automatically give you a tiff. Um, and so there's, there's things like that where, you know, it's similar to opportunity zone where there's, there's just inherent, um, incentives just based on where your project is located. Um, so I would always look at that, especially on the early stage, um, try to just understand what your city's priorities are. Um, like I know a lot of priorities for cities right now are affordable housing or prolonging affordable housing. There may be, I mean, even on the acquisition side, um, on the syndication side, I mean, there's, there's existing properties that have some affordability component to it. Um, or, you know, it was previously in the affordability program, there could be an opportunity there where you go to the city and you say, Hey, um, you know, we, we would like to fix these up, but we need your help, you know, with the tax abatements, like you talked about. And, you know, we'd like to keep these, maybe some portion of the units affordable if we can in turn keep taxes exactly where they are now and not have them ever be raised in the next 10 years, say. Um, I think it's always worth having that conversation because, um, you can you can a lot of times unlock value in properties um, that did not ever exist before, and and that's what it, that's one of the things I love about what we do is like it's literally just creative financing, and sometimes like we literally write the program in partnership with the city, you know, like we created the the first tax abatement program here in Nashville. They didn't have one, uh, which is crazy, but they didn't, and so we we had a project we needed to get it financed with a tax abatement. And so we help them write the program. And we've done that in other cities now. We've taken what we learned here and did it in other cities. Um, so it's typically if you're if you can figure out a way to offer something to the city, then they're willing to work with you and, and sometimes even write a brand new program and create a whole new type of financing that didn't exist before. No, I love it. The creative financing is really the key, right? If you're running the numbers and it don't make sense. Sometimes you just have to step back and say, okay, what are some other ways we could do? What if we partnered with these banks who really just want the credit? What if we sat down with the city and understood what it would take to get a tax abatement? Uh, what if we sat down and, and created a portion of the, the units and made them affordable? And again, going back to the earlier definition for clarity, it doesn't have to be necessarily low income. It just needs to be affordable. So lots of great information on how we can think a bit more creatively to do more deals, to um, really partner with our, our local governments, the local city officials, and really create that win-win situation. Now, Evan, you have also built uh, something else that's really incredible outside of just the homes and the real estate, the multifamily. You've built the Monumental Podcast to be one of the top 200 podcasts out there. I want to talk a little bit about the platform. Why did you decide to launch this? Yes, I, uh, I've honestly, I've had such a blast with this podcast. Um, and it really, the, the motivation behind it was, it was about two, two and a half years ago, um, where I met this venture capitalist, uh, and I was like, man, this guy's really cool. Like I want to keep talking to this guy. And I, I had to actually go to a wedding at the time. And so I was like, I, I need to leave, but what's my, what's my reason to keep talking? I'm a real estate developer. Like I don't really have any need specifically for a venture capitalist. And, but I was like, you know what? Let me tell him I have a podcast. And I literally just told him on the spot. I was like, Hey, I have a podcast where I interview great people like you and I'd love to have you on. And he's like, Oh sure. Here's my business card. Like, let's, let's make it happen. I was like, Oh, Oh dang. I guess, I guess I need to actually start a podcast now. And <laughs> <laughs> that, that was it. I mean, it, it, it's amazing how like one little thing can like, it flips in your head. And, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to ask him and, and it just make the ask and, and who knows where it turns up. I mean, literally now we've done over a hundred episodes and have had on some pretty phenomenal people and have been able to, to network with all kinds of awesome people have been able to provide crazy value to people just like yourself 
and Target Market Insights. I mean, that that's the fun thing about podcasts is like, I, I now have a platform too, to be able to reach out to anybody uh, and connect with anybody. And literally the sky's the limit. I mean, you know, that's what we're going to uh, really hone in on, on 2020. It's like, how do we take this and take it, you know, 10 X bigger? How do we, how do we really take this podcast to the next level? So I, I think that's phenomenal. I'm over here laughing. I almost have tears in my eyes <laughs> because you decided to launch a podcast just because you wanted to keep talking to the guy who was next to you at a table. Oh, like yeah. that's, that's hilarious, man. It reminds me of, uh, when I was in third grade, and I was supposed to pick uh, a language to take French or Spanish. I don't know why, but back then they didn't, I, they didn't care that I didn't ask my parents. And I remember the girl that I had a crush on in school, she was going to take French. So I decided to take French. So I spent nice. 10 years of my life learning French because of some cute girl in third grade. And you <laughs> launched this podcast because you wanted to keep talking to the guy next to you. Uh, yeah. I hope that <laughs> your podcast was way more successful than my French lessons. <laughs> um, and uh, you've gotten more value. I assume also you realize that, hey, a podcast is a great way to meet people, connect with them, build relationships and help other people along the way. Uh, and not just kind of your, your conversation. Because otherwise you could have just said, hey, man, I've enjoyed the conversation. Would love to continue to talk. Why don't you give me your number yeah. or, or business card? Uh, and that probably would have worked for you too, just for the record. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I'd always just like had that idea of a podcast in my head. And I was like, you know what? This is the guy. Like, let's start here. And yeah, man, it's it's pretty wild. And And, you know, like we talked about, it's like, who knows how many people you can talk to from here. And, and also like, I'm sure you've, you've seen with your podcast too. It's like, it's capital raising, it's uh, authority on matters. Uh, it's being included on things or being invited to things and, and just people actually reaching out to you instead of you reaching out to them. Like it just kind of flips the script on, on marketing. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great way to connect with others. And I think the biggest thing is, um, for me, at least, and, uh, and you tell me your thoughts, too. I'm, I'm curious. But for me, I think when I launched, part of it was to answer questions that I had that I felt were not getting answered uh, from other podcasts that I was checking out listening to. And then the other part was definitely a way for me to kind of put myself out there, let other folks know the kind of work we we're doing. Uh, let folks understand a little bit more about the way we see the marketplace, the way we approach everything in the business and give people a chance to just learn from our perspective, which we think has worked out really well. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, too. I, I, I think every time I every time I talk about the podcast, I, I love sharing that like it's not just a podcast, but it's also like using that podcast uh, through other mediums like social media, like you're, you're super active on LinkedIn, uh, crushing it on LinkedIn. And it's like combining that podcast with another platform or with like for, for my platform, the main one I've been using is Instagram. And it's literally like DMing people who I want to be guests on Instagram all the time. And that's led to probably, you know, 50% of my bigger name guests. And, and it, it literally is just messaging people, right? It's, it's taking what you know, taking your platform and then reaching out to people and, and making the ask. I think the last thing on the podcast is for me, um, it's a great way to talk to other guests and learn about their expertise. I mean, I think about this episode and all the wonderful knowledge you shared on development and working with government funding, um, understanding private public partnerships. I mean, for me to learn all that would have been very difficult for me to even figure out where to start, right? I mean, if I'm, I could Google articles for yeah. hours and probably not get the, and that's just to find articles of the information, right? I would still probably have way more questions after finding some articles, but the way that we could sit, talk, get clarity on, you know, what works, what doesn't work, the challenges as you see fit, and it's almost like personal consultation that we get to share with a bunch of other people too, as opposed to just someone's story. I think that's a phenomenal aspect of it as well. Yeah. All right, Evan, let's move on to our bullseye round. You ready? Let's do it. All right, Evan, how has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? 
I would say it really like one of the, well, an example of the first project I ever did, um, I actually let part of the land that we were under contract to, to buy and build on. Uh, I actually let a small piece of it, one of the contracts, uh, go out of contract. And we were two weeks away from closing I had been working on this deal for a year and I just didn't pay attention. I, I thought my brokers were paying attention to that. And, and so it taught me a lot of lessons of like double, triple check everything, create systems for everything. So now we have a tracking system for all of our contracts. Um, and, and also make sure you're learning and taking away something and growing every time you make a mistake. Um, so that, that was the, the last time that mistake was ever made. But all right. What is the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year? Uh, it's probably, it's going to be both four hour work week and uh, rich dad, poor dad. All right. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Uh, Land Clyde. It's an app on your phone that actually gives you GIS information, basically like uh, who owns a parcel and their address and even like the size of the parcel and the zoning. You said land glide? Yep, one word. All right. Land glide, definitely. All right, uh, what is the daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Uh, it's two things. I think uh, the main one is meditation. Uh, try to do that every day, every morning. And doing different forms of meditation. I've done Dr. Joe Dispenza's meditation and then also a lot of headspace. Um, that I highly recommend. And then reading as well. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? Uh, I would say go bigger sooner. I would say, I think in my head, I, I thought I needed to, you know, grow at a more gradual pace or, or do things in a linear fashion, but I don't think that's the case at all. I think you can start a lot more quickly um, if you're willing and able to, to invest in yourself, invest in mentors, and invest in your growth. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew just 12 months ago? <laughs> Um, I would say speak your truth. I would say speaking of, you know, speak from your heart, speak what you really want in the world and, um, and it'll come back to you and, and it'll align with who you are. All right. What advice would you give to a smart driven college student about the real world? A uh, smart driven college student, I would say find what you're passionate about and become the absolute best at it. What are you curious about right now? Uh, I am curious about, I think, I mean, I'm curious about a lot of things, but uh, one thing specifically, I would say, how is affordable housing going to be, um, how are cities going to handle that going forward? All right, Evan, you are based in Nashville. It's a great food town. Give me the best place to grab a bite. Pinewood Social, hands down. Pinewood Social, you have a go-to dish there? I, I do. It's basically what I do is I do all my business meetings there, uh, all my lunch meetings. And because it literally is like they have breakfast, they have lunch, they have dinner, they have late night drinks, like they have everything. Yeah. Um, and so go-to is like a, a, a good coffee and the salmon kale salad. Love it. Love it. Evan, uh, our listeners have heard a lot of great information from you today. You did an excellent job really just walking us through uh, the development process, at least the early stages and working with city officials and understanding what we need to do to get accomplished. For our listeners who want to learn more about you, development, uh, investment opportunities, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yes. So uh, it's either through my website, evanholiday.com. Uh, they can email me at evan at evanholiday. And that's H-O-L-L-A-D-A-Y.com. Uh, Instagram is a big way to very active there. Uh, Monumental podcast. And then finally, if they're interested in, in coaching or, 
you know, being mentored in development or really just taking their life to the next level, uh, coachwithevan.com. Excellent, Evan. Thank you for, for all that information there. If you are interested in the coaching, as he mentioned, you know, that's something he's big on giving back. And I've had a chance to sit down and talk to Evan and a uh, great guy to get to know, as you can tell. And I want to thank you again for doing something we haven't done before, which is really going through all those terms. But I know a lot of times, you know, we get on these shows and people start talking over people's heads and you're like, I don't know what half that stuff is. Yeah. So I wanted to make, I wanted to just make sure we took a second to really explain what some of those things were. So I appreciate that, Evan. You take care, man. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you again. And we hope you have a great day. All right. Yes. Love it. Had a blast, man. 